Well, friends, uh, today being Father's Day is, of course, a day we take time to stop and remember fathers. Uh, the fathers that we have around us still, uh, the fathers that we may live with or not, but uh, to stop and to remember. And, of course, for many of us, our fathers are no longer with us and it's appropriate to stop and to give thanks for them and although it may not have been perfect and, and sometimes it may have been uh, far from that, I do hope that you can stop and, and give thanks to God for your fathers or the father figures in your life. And I think for those of us whose fathers are no longer with us, the thing that we would love perhaps more than anything else, if we possibly could, would be to have an opportunity to talk with them, to spend some time talking, even if we know, well, even if perhaps we didn't talk with them that much uh, when they were still with us, even if we know that the conversation would be a little bit awkward. I think we would still love that opportunity, wouldn't we, to be able to talk with our fathers again. And I hope and I think uh, that this can be a reminder to us of the importance of speaking to God, what we call prayer. The importance of speaking to God who is called in the Bible our Father, our loving Heavenly Father. No matter what our earthly fathers look like, are like, we can know and remember that we have a loving Heavenly Father who knows us and cares for us and wants to hear from us. And so we ought to be encouraged to take the opportunity to speak to him. What we have in our Bible passage for today is a prayer. It might not immediately look like a prayer, but uh, that is how it comes across when we look at it a bit more closely. We're in this, these uh, closing chapters of Isaiah's prophecy and what we have seen as Isaiah has laid out for us uh, what God has shown him, what we've seen is that there is a promise that God will bring all things to an end, that the day will come when he will bring judgment on the earth on the basis of his righteousness and holiness and that a time will come when he will glorify Zion. And as we came to see, not necessarily, not even the physical city, Jerusalem, but the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly city, which is his people. That God has a glorious future for his people. And that will finally be seen on the judgment day. And so in the previous uh, chapters, we've seen that reality being laid out for us. But one of the things that Isaiah also uh, tells us back in chapter 62 is that as this expectation of the glorification of uh, Zion, the heavenly city, comes about, God promises to post watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem. Now again, we have to understand this as being um, perhaps metaphorical, Although real people, they're not necessarily on the walls of the literal Jerusalem. And their job, the job of watchmen, is to speak out. To tell people what God wants them to hear. But their job is actually twofold. They're to speak to the people for God, but they're also to speak to God on behalf of the people. They're, they're called to be intercessors, praying to God. And... I guess Isaiah is thinking of uh, the prophets, those who's, who's, who are called to this work. And so back in chapter 62, verse 6, I've posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. God wants there to be watchmen continually speaking to the people, looking for what is to come and calling out to God to bring it to pass. Now, the reason that's significant is because when we come to chapter 63, verse 7, that is exactly the thing that is being uh, spoken of in that first verse. I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord. 
It might not be immediately obvious from that particular translation, but the, the verbs are the same. It's the remembrance of the one who will bring things to remembrance. I will bring to remembrance the kindness of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised. He will bring it to the remembrance of the people, but he's also going to bring it to the remembrance of God. He is interceding, praying to God for the people in particular. And so this whole section, right through the end of chapter 64, I think, the commentators uh, tell me, and I agree, that it, this is all a prayer, a prayer of Isaiah uh, inspired by God. And so the first section of it is basically remembering God's mercy towards his people, right through to, um, to verse 14 of chapter 63. And from... Uh, Verse 15 of chapter 63 through the end of chapter 64 is a section calling out to God to keep the promises that he has made, the things that Isaiah has spelled out in his prophecy. So let's have a look at uh, what the prayer involves, the prayer of the intercessor. So the first thing, I think, is remembering God's mercy. What he says there in verse 7, the kindnesses of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised. Because he has done many good things for Israel according to his compassion and his many kindnesses. And verse 8, surely he said, they are my people, children who will be true to me. And so he became their saviour. God chose the people believing that they would be uh, faithful to him, at least to some extent, at least some of them, and so he chose to save them. And that sort of alludes right back to the promises that God made to uh, Abraham, Isaac and, and Jacob, who he renamed Israel, and their descendants throughout the generations. God chose them to bless, to be his children, and so he would be their saviour. And so when they were distressed, verse uh, 9, he was distressed. His angel was with them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He, he rescued them, purchased them, if you like. He carried them as on eagle's wings. It's very much alluding to the exodus from Egypt, how God brought them out and rescued them, brought them to himself in the promised land. And yet despite God's mercy towards them, despite God's uh, grace and compassion yet verse 10 they still rebelled they grieved his holy spirit so he turned and became their enemy and he himself fought against them when the people rebelled against god they did face his punishment and that began even as they were at uh, the foot of mount sinai receiving the law it continued as they wandered in the wilderness in fact that's why they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years even after they got into the promised land, they still faced God's punishment at times because of their rebellion. And finally, it got so bad that they were, were sent out, as we've seen as we've uh, gone through what Isaiah has to say. They were sent out into exile, captured, taken away. There will be punishment if the people continue to rebel. But yet, when the people return to God his people recalled the days of old the days of Moses and his people when they thought back onto what God had done for them in the past and they turned back to him because they wondered where is he who rescued their ancestors well they are rescued they are brought back out they recognize that God is their saviour again and he does rescue them again. But sometimes when they're in the midst of that sort of difficulty and suffering, they need to call out to God again. And that's what Isaiah kind of does there uh, in the section which begins from verse 15. And he begins by saying, Look down from heaven, Lord, and see from your lofty throne, holy and glorious, 
And he asks, where are your zeal and your might? Your tenderness and compassion are withheld from us. They are still, in some sense at least, suffering. Even the people as they returned from the exile, they would have felt very keenly that the city that they returned to was in rubble, the, the, the temple was in rubble, the, the whole countryside was still suffering. And so they might well cry out to God like this, look down from heaven, Lord, see what's going on with us. Where is your tenderness and compassion? They're, they're still withheld from us. But what is it that Isaiah comes back to? And what is it that the people can come back to in the, even in that time where they're still feeling a bit abandoned by God? Well, we have it there in verse 16. But you are our father. You are our father. Though Abraham does not know us or Israel acknowledge us, you, Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. Even if the people of uh, Abraham, and remember Abraham uh, had a name that was changed from Abram to Abraham. It means father, great father, big father. But even if Abraham doesn't recognise them, even if Israel doesn't recognise them, God is their father. He is the one who, who brought their nation into existence. He is the one who has been with them and cared for them all this time. He is the one who really cares for them as his special children. The one who redeemed them, rescued them out of slavery. And so Isaiah holds on to that, that God is their father. And so verse 17 to 19 where he recognises or asks the question, why, Lord, do you make us wander from our ways? Why do you let us wander and harden our hearts so we don't revere you? Return to us for the sake of your servants. Why do you, why do you let us suffer because of our rebellion? Come back, be with us. For a little while, he says, they possessed the holy place. Now it's the enemies have trampled it down. You, Lord haven't ruled over them in other words you have been our god why do they get to trample over the promised land why do they get to trample over us he is wondering he's asking these questions and you know the interesting thing is that throughout the centuries the, the israelites asked questions as they went through difficult times even into modern times after the destruction of the the temple the Jews have gone through many times where they've had to suffer. Perhaps, obviously, the great, uh, terrible time of the Second World War. And they ask these questions. But it's not just the Jewish people, it's Christians as well. Many times Christians have gone through great suffering, feeling that they were abandoned by God. And it's okay to ask the question, why, why is this happening to us, Lord? Why are your enemies seemingly victorious? Now again, Isaiah has already told us that this won't go on forever. The time will come when those who have opposed God, who have opposed his people, have, have uh, rebelled against God, will face his judgment and, and because of his righteousness. And yet, Isaiah is asking the question on behalf of, of everyone, why is this happening, Lord? But then as we come into chapter 64, he moves from asking the question to pleading to God. O oh Lord, that you would rend the heavens, that you would tear open the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains would tremble. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes the water to boil, come down and make your name known to your enemies. Cause the nations to quake before you. This is alluding back again to um, Mount Sinai when God did send uh, fire down, it seemed, seemingly. The, the mountain was on fire, it seemed. Lightning and thunder and all those things happening and the people quaked before God. It was the time of the beginning of, of the covenant where they had to recognise that God was great and they were, well, privileged to be called his people, but they had a responsibility 
Now, Isaiah is praying that God would, would do the same again, but that the whole world would know that the Lord is God, that the nations uh, would quake before him. He's remembering that God had done those awesome things in the past. He wants, them, he wants God to do them again. And there's a sense in which Isaiah has been saying, well, Lord, you're telling me you're going to do this. Before the end comes, you're going to do some amazing things. And he's pleading, God, do it now. Then from verse uh, 4, he's again saying that uh, God has hidden his face from them and from the nations as well. But God has, he does come to the help of those who turn back to him, who gladly do what is right, verse uh, verse 5, who remember his ways. Of course, when they continued to sin, he was angry. How then can we be saved? There's this continual questioning. He wants God to come and, and make himself known. He knows that God will save those who turn back to him, and yet... There's this dilemma because God's people are far from perfect. They too will sin. And because of that, God is angry. How can they be saved? Well, the thing about this, of course, is that God has an answer to these questions. And Isaiah has already spelt it out in his prophecy. And we remember, of course, that he has told us about the servant who would come, that God would send, the one filled with the Holy Spirit who would suffer for us. And you remember the words of Isaiah chapter 53, I'm sure, verse uh, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. Verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to our own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. How can we be saved, Isaiah is saying? God provides an answer. God provides a way. God provides a saviour who is the suffering servant who stands between God and us. He, actually, he ultimately is the great intercessor. He is the one who speaks to us on God's behalf, but he also speaks to God on our behalf. And he puts himself ultimately between us and God to take God's wrath on himself so that we can be forgiven, so that we can have a new relationship with God, so that we can be brought into God's family so that we can be his children because God is the great father. He has saved a people for himself, not just some people who maybe he remembers if he stops to think about them. No, he loves them as his own family because he is their father. In fact, he is our father if we come to him through the Lord Jesus. That's the only way we can come to him, of course. That's the only way that we can be saved. And so Isaiah comes towards the conclusion of this prayer by by giving the answer again, verse 8. Yet you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And so he says, do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Look on us, we pray, for we are your people. That's kind of where Isaiah brings his prayer to. Remembering all that God has done for his people in the past, remembering that God has promised to be the father of his people. He comes back after calling on God to bring about all these things. He comes back to this, you, Lord, are our father. You love us. You care for us. You make salvation possible by sending your son into the world. 
And so in praying like this to God, Isaiah points us towards the Saviour, towards the salvation that can come through the Son, who brings us into relationship with God, the holy, perfect, righteous God, even though we're not, who brings us into relationship with him through the Son. And he concludes this, uh, this prayer by remembering that God's cities have been trodden down, even Jerusalem has been a desolation. Remember, when he talks about Jerusalem, I think he's talking about the people, not the place. It's all been trodden down and lies in ruins. And after this, Lord, will you hold yourself back? Will you keep silent and punish us beyond measure? He's pleading to God for an end to the suffering and the injustice that goes on in this world. And that's a fair thing to pray for, isn't it? To plead to God, to bring it to an end. But of course, when God brings it to an end, that will be the end of the opportunity. That will be the judgment day. It will be great and glorious for those who know the Lord, but it will be terrible for those who don't. Now, friends, I've been saying that um, as Isaiah has been praying this prayer, he keeps on pointing us back to God our Father. We need to remember that it was Jesus who invited us to speak, of, to, speak to God as our Father, to address God as our Father. And we can only know, it was, it was not a common thing in the Old Testament, in the ancient uh, world. Even for the Israelites, it wasn't common for them to address God as Father, but that's what Isaiah does here. He stands in this uh, line of intercessors, of people who stand between God and the people, and he prays for the people, and he, he calls out to God to be the father of his people as he has promised. And of course, it's Jesus himself who comes to us as the son and invites us to call out to God as our father as well. We see it, of course, in the Lord's Prayer. It begins, Jesus teaches us to address God as our Father. And yes, it, it continues in praying that, that God would forgive our sins because we've rebelled against him as we forgive others. It continues in asking God for everything we need uh, for our spiritual as well as for our physical needs. And it also, and it concludes by praying for his glory, that his kingdom might come. We actually need to remember that the kingdom prayer while it invites us to address God as our father is also a prayer that his will be done on earth first of all in our lives but then ultimately throughout the whole world in a sense it's a prayer that the end would come and when we see the injustice and the terrible suffering that continues then fair enough that's a, a good thing to pray for and yet we also want to see others come to know the saviour others come into his family and so we pray that his kingdom come that others might come in as well so friends when we see a prayer like this i hope that we're encouraged to recognize what isaiah recognizes that god the great god who who is at work in the world bringing about his plans and purposes is also the loving father of his people I think it's a very appropriate thing to remember on Father's Day. To remember the fatherhood of God. To remember how much he loves us. And he calls us to, to approach him and to call him our father. Will you pray with me now that we will do that? Father God, we do thank you that you are our loving heavenly father. That you have made it possible for us to come to you as Father, through your Son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you that as the suffering servant, he laid down his life. He stood between you and us and bore your wrath, that we could have forgiveness, that we could enter into your family and be your children. Father, we pray that you might help us always to rejoice and, and be thankful for your love shown to us in this way. And Father, we do pray that your kingdom might come that the suffering and injustice of this world will one day be seen for what it is, temporary, as you bring about righteousness and justice. 
But Father, we pray that on that day that you might help each one of us to stand before you confident not in ourselves but in the righteousness of your son and that those we know and love might be standing there with us. That all those around us in our suburb, in our city, in our nation might know you as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.